Act 1, Scene 1, On the Streets of Rome. Hence, home, you idle creatures, get you home. Is this a holiday? What? No, you're not being mechanical. You ought not to not walk upon a laboring day without the sign of your profession. Speak, what trade art thou? Truly, sir, in respect of a fine workman, I am, but as you would say, a cobbler. But what trade art thou? Answer me directly. A trade, sir, that I hope I may use with a safe conscience, which is indeed, sir, a mender of bad souls. But wherefore art not in thy shop today? Why dost thou lead these men about the streets? Truly, sir, to wear out their shoes, to get myself into more work. But indeed, sir, we make holiday to see Caesar and to rejoice in his triumph. Wherefore rejoice? What conquest brings he home? What tributaries follow him to Rome to grace and captive bonds his chariot wheels? You blocks. You stones, you worse than senseless things. Oh, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome, knew you not Pompey? Many a time and oft have you climbed up to walls, to battlements, to towers and windows, yea, to chimney tops, your infants in your arms, and there have sat the live long day with patient expectation to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And when you saw his chariot but appear, have you not made a universal shout that Tiber trembled underneath her banks to hear the replication of your sounds made in her concave shores? And do you now put on your best attire? And do you now cull out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in his way that comes in triumph over Pompey's blood? Be gone, run to your houses, fall upon your knees, pray to the gods to intermit the plague that needs must light on this ingratitude. Go, go, good countrymen, and for this fault assemble all the poor men of your sort, draw them to the Tiber banks and weep your tears into the channel, to the lowest stream to kiss the most exalted shores of all. See whether they're Basis metal be not moved, they vanish tongue-tied in their guiltiness. Go you down that way towards the capital, and drive away the vulgar from the streets, so do you too where you perceive them thick. These growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing will make him fly an ordinary pitch. Who else would soar above the view of men and keep us all in servile fitness? <laughs> Act 1, Scene 2, Outside the Capitol. Calpurnia. <laughs> Caesar speaks. Calpurnia. Calpurnia, stand you Here, directly. My lord. Yeah, stand you directly in Antonius' way when he doth run his course. Antonius. Caesar, my lord. Forget not in your speed to touch Calpurnia. The baron touched in this holy chase. Shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember when Caesar says, do this, it is performed. Set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar! Huh? Who calls? Bid every noise be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a, a tongue shriller than all the music cry, Caesar! Speak, <clears throat> Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What, what, what man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Well, set him before me, let me see his face. Hello, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. Oh, speak. What sayest to me now? Speak. Once again. Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> he is a dreamer. Let us leave him. 
Mas. <clears throat> Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. I pray you do. <laughs> I am not gamesome. I do like some part of that quick spirit that is an Antony. Let me not hinder Cassius your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love that I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil perhaps to my behaviours. But let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus with himself at war forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine have buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, Brutus, <clears throat> can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection by some other things. Tis just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, hath wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius? that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me. Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. And be not jealous on me, good Brutus. Were I a common laugher, or did use to stale with ordinary oaths my love to every new protester, if you know that I do fawn on men and hug them hard and after scandal them, or if you know that I profess myself to banqueting all the rout, then, then hold me dangerous. Hey! Oh, Caesar! What means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. I do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius, yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honour in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me as I love the name of honour more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favour. Well, honour is the subject of my story. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We are both fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, Upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Typha chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. And so indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink! And I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder bear the old Anchises, so from the ways of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature who must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but not on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain, 
And when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It is true, this God did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan. I. And that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write in speeches in their books, alas, it cried, give me some drink, young Cassius, as a sick girl. <laughs> Ye gods, it doth amaze me, a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. <laughs> Another general shout. I do believe these applauses are for some new honours that are heaped on Caesar. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonourable graves. Men, at some time, are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar should be in that Caesar. Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Write them, weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now, in the names of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he is grown so great? Age, thou art shamed. Rome, thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. Who could say till now, with the talk of Rome, that her wide walls encompassed but one man? Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. <laughs> Now you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times I shall recount hereafter. For this present I would not, so with love I might entreat you be any further moved. What you have said I will consider. What you have to say I will hear with patience and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than repute himself a, run, a son of Rome under these hard conditions as this time is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done. Caesar is returning. <clears throat> As they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what hath preceded note today. I will do so. <laughs> but look, you Cassius, the angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Calpurnia's <laughs> cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital, being crossed in conference by some senators. Asker will tell us what the matter is. Antonius. Caesar. Let me have men about me that are fat. Sleek headed men and such as sleep at nights. Yont Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well given. Hmm. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid. <laughs> so soon as that, spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer. And he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou doth, Antonius. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles and smiles in such a sort as, he were, as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves and therefore they are dangerous. 
I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what, what, what thou thinkst of him. Hmm? You pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? Hi, Casca. Tell us what it has chanced today. That Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what had chanced. <laughs> Why? There was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand thus, and then the people <laughs> fell a shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? <laughs> Why, for that too. Was the crown offered him thrice? Aye, Mary was, and he put it by thrice, every time gentler than other, and every putting by mine honest neighbours shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I, I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, yet... "'Twas not a crown neither, "'twas one of those coronets. "'And as I told you, he put it by once, "'but for all that, to my thinking, "'he would fain have had it. "'And then he offered it to him again, "'and then he put it by again. <coughs> "'But to my thinking, "'he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. "'And then he offered it the third time. "'He put it by the third time. And still, as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped their chapped hands and, and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it almost choked Caesar, for he swooned and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. Soft, I pray you. What? Did Caesar swoon? I uh, fell down in the marketplace and then foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Tis very like he hath the falling sickness. <laughs> no, Caesar had it not, but you and I and honest Casca have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. If the ragtag people did not chap, clap him and hiss him according as they pleased and displeased him, as they used to do to the players in the theatre, I am no true man. What said he when he came unto himself? Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me ope his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. If I had been a man of any occupation, if I had not taken him at a word, I would I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, he came away thus sad. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye. He spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, if I tell you that, I'll ne'er look you in the face again. But those who, that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. <sighs> Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I'm promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive and your mind hold and your dinner worth the eating. Good, I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. What a blunt fellow this has grown to be. <laughs> he was quick metal when he went to school. Well, so is he now in execution of any bold or noble enterprise. However, he puts on this tardy form. This... Rudeness is a source to his good wit, which gives men better stomachs to digest his words with better appetite. So it is. For this time I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please speak with me, I will come home to you. Or, if you will, come home to me. 
and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble, yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble buds keep ever with their like, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. I will this night in several hands in at his windows throw as if they came from several citizens. Writings, all tending to the great opinion Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him or worse days endure. Act 1, Scene 3, Rome's Streets at Night. Vive in Casca. Brought you Caesar home? Why, why are you breathless? And why stare you so? Are you not moved when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing unfirm? Oh, Cicero, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have rived the knotty oaks, and I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam. To be exalted with the threatening clouds, but never till tonight, never till now, did I go through a tempest dropping fire. Either there is civil strife in heaven or else the world too saucy with the gods and senses them to send destruction. Indeed, it is a strange disposed time, but men may construe things after their fashion, clean from the purpose of the things themselves. Hmm? Come Caesar to the capital tomorrow? He doth, for he did bid Antonius send word to you he would be there tomorrow. Hmm. Good night then, Casca. This disturbed sky is not to walk in. Farewell, Cicero. Who's there? A Roman. Oh, Casca, by your voice. Your ear is good. Cassius, what night is this? A very pleasing night to honest men. Whoever knew the heavens menace so? Those that have known the earth so full of faults. For my part, I have walked about the streets, submitting me under the perilous night, and thus unbraced Casca, as you see, have bared my bosom to the thunderstorm. And when the cross blue lightning seemed to open the breast of heaven, I did present myself even in the aim and very flash of it. But wherefore did you so much tempt the heavens? Uh, it is the part of men to fear and tremble when the most mighty gods by token send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. You are dull, Casca, and those sparks of life that should be in a Roman you do want or else you use not. You look pale and gaze and put on fear and cast yourself in wonder to see the strange impatience of the heavens. But if you would consider the true cause that heaven is infused with these fires to make them instruments of fear and warning onto some monstrous state. Now, could I, Casca, name to thee a man most like this dreadful night that thunders, lightens, opens graves, and roars us doth the lion in the capital, a man no mightier than thyself or me in personal action, yet prodigious grown and fearful as these strange eruptions are? Tis Caesar that you mean, is it not, Cassius? Let it be who it is. Indeed. They say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king, and he shall wrap, wear his crown by sea and land in every place, save here in Italy. I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage shall deliver Cassius, 
Therein, ye gods, you make the weak most strong. Therein, ye gods, you tyrants do defeat. No stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of spirit. But life, being weary of these worldly bars, never lacks power to dismiss itself. So can I. So every bondman in his own hand bears the power to cancel his captivity. And why should Caesar then be a tyrant? Poor man. I know he would not be a wolf, but that he sees the Romans are but sheep. He were no lion, were not Romans hinds. Those that with haste will make a mighty, mighty fire with weak straws. What trash is Rome? What rubbish and what awful when it serves for the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar. But oh, grief, where hast thou led me? I do perhaps speak this before a willing bondman. Then I know my answer must be made. But I am armed, and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca, and to such a man that is no fleering telltale. Hold, my hand. Be facetious for redress of all these griefs, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. Now, know you, Casca, I have moved already some certain of the noblest-minded Romans to undergo with me an em enterprise of honourable, dangerous consequence. And I do know by this they stay for me in Pompey's porch. For now... This fearful night, there is no stir or walking in the streets, and the complexion of the element in favours like the work we have in hand, most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. Stand close a while, for here comes one in haste. Tis Sinner. I do know him by his gait. He is a friend. Sinner! Where haste you, sir? To find out you. Who's that? Metallus Simba? No, it is Casca, one in corporate to our tents. Am I not stayed for, sinner? I am glad, aunt. What a fearful night is this. There's two or three of us have seen strange sights. Am I not stayed for, tell me? Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our party. Be you content. <clears throat> Good sinner, take this paper and look you laid in the praetor's chair where Brutus may but find it, and throw this in at his window. Set it up with wax upon old Brutus' statue. All this done, repair to Pompey's porch, where you shall find us. Is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there? All but Metallus Simba. And he's gone to seek you at your house. Well, I will hide, and so bestow these papers as you bade me. That done, repair to Pompey's theatre. Come, Casca, you and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and the man entire upon the next encounter yields him ours. Oh, he sits high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear offence in us, his countenance, like richest alchemy, will change to virtue and to worthiness. Him and his worth and our great need of him you have well conceited. Let us go, for it is after midnight and ere day we will awake him and be sure of him. Act 2, Scene 1. Brutus's Private Garden. Lucius, ho! I cannot, by the progress of the stars, give guess how near today. Lucius, I say! Called you, my lord. Get me a candle in my study, Lucilius, and when it is lighted, come and call me here. I will, my lord. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder that craves the wary walking. Crown him, that, and then, I grant, we put a sting in him, that at his will he may 
do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known him when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upwards turns his face, and when he attains the utmost run, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees which he did ascend. So Caesar may. Then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is fashionate thus, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities, which therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would as his kind grow mischievous and kill him in his shell. The candle burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this here paper, thus sealed up, and I'm sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again. It's not day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the Ides of March? I know not, sir. Look in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. The exhalations whizzing in the air give so much light I may read by them. Brutus, thou sleepest. Awake and see thyself. Shall Rome and etc. speak, strike, redress? Brutus, thou sleepest. Awake. Such instigations have often been dropped where I have took them up. Shall Rome and etc. Thus must I piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's oar? What? Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? O oh, Rome. I make thee promise. If the redress will follow, thou receivest thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, March is wasted 14 days. Tis good. I go to the gate, someone knocks. Since Cassius did, since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council and the state of man like to a little kingdom suffers then the natures of an insurrection. Sir, it is your brother Cassius at the door who doth desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir, there are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir, their hats are plucked about their ears and half their faces buried in their cloaks that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favor. Let them enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy. Shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free. Well, then by day, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none, conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability. For if thou paid thy native semblance on, not Erebus itself were dim enough to hide thee from prevention. Well, I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them. And no man here but honours you. And every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. This is Trebonius. He is welcome hither. This Decius Brutus. He is welcome too. This Casca, this Sinner, and this Metellus Simba. They are all welcome. What watchful cares to interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? I say, here lies yeast, doth not the day break here. No. Oh, pardon, sir, it doth. And yon grey lines that fret the clouds are messengers of day. And you shall confess that you are both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, 
the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, weighing the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher toward the north, he first presents his fire, and the high east stands as the capital directly here. Give me your hands all over, one by one. And let us swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off betimes, and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny rage on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I am sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word? To think that our cause or our performance didn't need an oath when every drop of blood in every Roman bears and nobly bears is guilty of a several bastardy if he do break the smallest particle of any promise that hath passed from him. But what of Cicero? Shall we sound him? I think he will stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Or oh, let us have him, for his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion, and by men's voices to commend our deeds. It shall be said his judgment ruled our hands. Our youths and wildness shall no wit appear, but all be buried in his gravity. Oh, name him not. Let us not break with him, for he will never follow anything that other men begin. Then leave him out. Indeed, he is not fit. How no man else be touched but only Caesar. Decius, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver. And you know, his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all, which to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrifices, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we could then come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for the hounds. And let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir up their servants to an act of rage, and after seem to chide them. This shall make our purpose necessary and not envious, which so appearing to the common eyes, we shall be called purgers not murderers. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness and much company. There is no fear in him, let him not die. For he will live and laugh at this hereafter. It is time to part. But it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or not. For he, he is superstitious grown of late. Quite from the main opinion he held once of fantasy, of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night, and the persuasion of his auguries may hold him from the capital today. Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I cannot sway him, for he loves to hear that unicorns may be betrayed by trees, and bears with glasses, elephants with holes, lions with toils, and men with flatterers. But when I tell him he hates flatterers, he says he does, being then most flattered. Let me work, for I can give his humour the true bent, and I will bring him to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there and fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Is that the uttermost, and fail not then. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus, and friends, 
disperse yourselves, but all remember what you have said and show yourselves true Romans. Good gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. So good morrow to you, everyone. Boy, Lucilius, fast asleep. There's no matter. Enjoy the honey-heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures, nor no fantasies, which busy care draws in the brains of men. Therefore, thou sleepest so sound. Brutus, my lord. Portia, what mean you? Why, for you rise now, it is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw cold morning. Nor for yours, neither. You've ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, and then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not. But with an angry waft of your hand gave me sign for me to leave. So I did fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled, and withal hoping it was an effect of humour, which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep. And could it work so much upon your shape as it hath prevailed on your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. My lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I'm not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it a uh, physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humours of the dank morning? What? Is Brutus sick? And will, will he still out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and, and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offence in your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of, and upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty by all our vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one that you unfold to me yourself your half why you are so heavy and what men tonight have had to resort to you for here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness Beg not, gentle Portia. I should not need if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus. Is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself, but as it were, instead of limitation, to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus Harlot, and not his wife. You are my true and honourable wife, as dear to me as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then should I know this secret? I grant I am woman, but with all a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but, but with all a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter, think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience? 
and not my husband's secrets? Oh, he gods, <laughs> render me worthy of this noble wife. Portia, go in a while, and by and by thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the charactery of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. <laughs> Act two, scene two, Caesar's stately home. Nor heaven nor earth hath been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help ho, they murder Caesar. Who's within? My lord. Oh, go bid the priests do present sacrifice and bring me their opinions of success. I will, my lord. Hmm. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Oh, Caesar shall forth. The things that threaten me never looked back on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar! I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen, who counts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and ripe form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the oar. Air, horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all you said. I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth for these predictions, and all these are in the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. All the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. What say the augurers? They would not have you to stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. The gods, oh, the gods do this in, in favor and shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast within a heart if he should stay at home for fear. No, Caesar shall not. For danger, oh, danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are, we are two lions littered in the one day and I the older and more terrible. And Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my Lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. And we'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house and he shall say you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Mark Antony shall say I am not well. And for thy humor, I shall stay at home. Uh, here's Jesse is Brutus. He shall tell them so. Hmm? Caesar, all hail. Mm. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. Yes, and you are come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators and tell them I will not come today. Cannot is false, and that I dare not, falser. I will not come today. Tell them, Decius. Say he's sick. Oh, no, no. So Caesar send a lie. 
have I in conquest stretched mine arm so far to be afeard to tell the youngers the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is my will. <sighs> I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight, she saw my statue, and which with a hundred, a hundred, a hundred holes, they did run pure blood, and, and many Romans come smiling and, and did bathe their hands in it. And these did she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent, and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes in which so many Romans bathed signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood and that great men shall pass for tinctures, stains, relics and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. And this way you have well expounded it. I have, when you have heard what I can say. And know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for some one to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, lo, Caesar is afraid. Pardon me, Caesar, for my love, my dear, dear love to our proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem to me now, Calpurnia. I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. Uh, and look, where, where, where Cicero comes uh, to fetch me. Good morrow, Caesar. Yes, welcome, Cicero. <laughs> what, Brutus? Are you stirred so early too? <laughs> Good morrow, Casca. Uh, what is the clock? Caesar, it is stricken eight. I uh, thank you for your pangs and courtesy. See, Antonius, that revels long a nights, is notwithstanding up. Good morrow, Antony. So to most noble Caesar. <laughs> Bid them prepare within. I am to blame for to be waited for. So now, Cinna, now Metellus. What, Trebonius, I have an hour's talk in score for you. Remember that you call on me today. Be near me that I might remember you. Caesar, I will. And so near will I be that your best friend shall wish I had been further. Uh, good friends, go in and taste some wine with me and we, like friends, will straight away together. <laughs> that every like is not the same. Oh, Caesar, the heart of Brutus yearns to think upon. Act two, scene three, an office nearby. Caesar, beware of Brutus. Take heed of Cassius. Come not near Casca. Have an eye on Cinna. Trust not Trebonius. Mark well Metellus Simba. Decius Brutus loves thee not. Thou hast wronged them all, every one. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. If thou beest immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. Thou mighty gods defend thee, thy lover, Artemidorus. Here I will stand till Caesar passes along, and as a suitor will I give him this. My heart laments that virtue cannot live out of the teeth of emulation. 
If thou read this, O Caesar, thou mayest live. If not, the fates with traitors do contrive. <laughs> Act 2, Scene 4, Outside Brutus's House. Pretty boy, run to the Senate House. Stay not to answer me, but get thee gone. Why dost thou stay? Uh, to know my errand, madam. I would have had thee there, and here again, ere I can tell thee what thou shouldst do there. Oh, God, see. Be strong upon my side and set a huge mountain between my heart and tongue. <sighs> I have a man's mind, but a woman's might. How hard is it for a woman to keep counsel? Art thou here yet? But, madam, what should I do? Uh, run to the capital and nothing else, or, and, and so return to you and nothing else? Yes. Bring me word, boy, if thy lord look well, for he went sickly forth, and take good note what Caesar doth and what suitors press to him. Hark, boy, what noise is that? I hear none, madam. Oh, pretty, pretty, listen well. I heard a bustling rumour like a fray, and the wind brings it from the capital. Sooth, madam, I, I hear nothing. Uh, come, come hither, fellow. Which way hast thou been? At mine own house, good lady. What is it o'clock? About the ninth hour, lady. Is Caesar yet gone to the capital? Madam, not yet. I go to take my stand to see him pass on to the capital. Thou hast some suit to Caesar, hast thou not? That I have, lady. If it will please Caesar to be so good a Caesar as to hear me, I shall beseech him to befriend himself. Why? Knowest thou any harms intended towards him? None that I know will be, much that I fear may chance. Good morrow to you. Here the street is narrow, the throng that follows Caesar at the heels of senators, of praetors, Common suitors will crowd a feeble man almost to death. I'll get me to a place more void, and there speak to Caesar as he comes along. I must go in. I mean, how weak a thing the heart of woman is. Oh, Brutus, the heavens speed thee in thy enterprise. Sure, the boy heard me. Brutus hath a, hath a suit that Caesar will not grant. I grow faint. Run, Lucilius, and commend me to my lord. Say I am merry, and come to me again, and bring me word what he doth say to thee. Act three, scene one. Outside the capital. The Ides of March are come. I, Caesar, but not gone. I would thou read this schedule. Tremonius doth desire you to all read at your best leisure. This is some humble suit. Oh, Caesar, read mine first, for mine's a suit that touches Caesar nearer. Read it, great Caesar. What touches us ourselves shall be last served. Delay not, Caesar. Read it instantly. What? Is the fellow mad? Sirrah, give place. What, urge you your petitions in the street? Come to the capital. I wish you your enterprise today may thrive. What enterprise, Cicero? Fare you well. Look, how he makes to seize and mark him. I fear our purpose is discovered. Casca, be sudden, for we fear prevention. Brutus, what shall be done? If this be known, Cassius or Caesar never shall turn back, for I will slay myself. Cassius, be constant. 
Cicero is there and speaks not of our purposes. For lo, he smiles and Caesar doth not change. Trebonius knows his time. But look you, Brutus, he draws Mark Antony out of the way. Where is Metellus Simba? Let him go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Casca, you are the first that rears your hand. Are we, are we all ready? Uh, what is now a mess that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant Caesar. Metellus Simba throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simba. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn preordinance and first decree into the law of children, but not found to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed for the true quality with that which melteth falls. I mean, sweet words, low crooked courtesies are base spaniel fawning. Thy brother, by decree, is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than mine own? to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother. I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simba may have immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon, as low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Cassius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you, if I could pray to move, prayers would move me, but I am constant as the northern stars of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire and every one doth shine. But there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world it is furnished well with men and men are flesh and blood and apprehensive. Yet in the number I do not know but one that unassailable holds on his rank, unshaked of motion, and that I am he. Let me show a little of it, even in this, that I was constant Simba should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. Oh, Caesar. Hence, Great Caesar. Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak hands for me. Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Run, hence proclaim, cry it in the streets. Come to the common pulpits and cry out, liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement. People and senators, be not affrighted. Fly not, stand stiff. Ambition's debt is paid. Go to the pulpit, Brutus. And Cassius too. Where is Cicero? Here. Quite confounded with this mutiny. Stand fast together, lest some friend of Caesar's should chance. Talk not of standing. Cicero, good cheer. There is no harm intended to your person, nor to no Roman else. So tell them, Cicero. 
Leave us, Cicero, lest that the people rushing on us should do your age some mischief. Do so, and let no man abide this deed, but we, the doers. Where is Antony? Fled to his house, amazed. Men, wives, and children stare, cry out, and run as it were doomsday. Thanks, we will know your pleasures. That we shall die, we know. Tis but the time and the drawing days out that men stand upon. Why, he that cuts off twenty years of life cuts off so many years of fearing death. Grant that, and then is death a benefit. So are we Caesar's friends, that we have abridged his time of fearing death. Stoop, Romans, stoop and let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons o'er our heads, let us all cry, peace, freedom, and liberty. Stoop then and wash. Ah, how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unknown and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport, now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? Ah, so oft as that shall be, so often shall the knot of us be called, the men that gave their country liberty. What, shall we forth? Aye, every man away. Brutus shall lead, and we will grace his healed with the most boldest and best hearts of Rome. Soft, who comes here? A friend of Antony's. Thus Brutus did my master bid me kneel, thus did Mark Antony bid me fall down, and being prostrate, thus he bade me say, Brutus is noble, wise, valiant, and honest. Caesar was mighty, bold, royal, and loving. Say I love Brutus, and I honor him. Say I feared Caesar, honored him, and loved him. If Brutus will vouchsafe that Antony may safely come to him and be resolved, uh, that how Caesar hath deserved to lie in death, Mark Antony shall not love Caesar dead so well as Brutus living, but will follow the fortunes and affairs of noble Brutus through the hazards of this untrod state with all the true faith. So says my mas master Antony. Thy master is a wise and valiant Roman. I never thought him worse. Tell him, so please him come unto this place, he shall be satisfied, and by my honour depart untouched. I'll fetch him presently. I know that we shall have him well to friend. I wish we may, but yet I have a mind that fears him much, and my misgiving still falls shrewdly to the purpose. But here comes Antony. Welcome, oh. Mark Antony. Almighty oh, Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils, shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? <clears throat> if I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords, made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech ye, if you bear me hard, now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so, no mean of death as here by Caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. Oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. Though now we must appear bloody and cruel as by our hands and this present act you see we do. Yet see you but our hands and this the bleeding business they have done, our hearts you see not. They are pitiful and pity to the general wrong of Rome, as fire drives out fire, so pity, pity, hath done this deed on Caesar. For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony, 
our arms in strength of malice and our hearts of brother's temper do receive you in all, with all kind love, good thoughts and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude, beside themselves with fear. And then when we deliver you the cause, why I, that did love Caesar when I struck him, have thus proceeded. I doubt not of your wisdom. Let each man render me his bloody hand. Gentlemen all, alas, what shall I say? My credit now stands on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceit me, either a coward or a flatterer. That I did love thee, Caesar, oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee, dearer than thy death, to see thy Anthony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes, most noble, in the presence of thy course? Had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Pardon me, Julius. Here wast thou bade, brave heart. Here didst thou fall. And here thy hunters stand, signed in thy spoil and crimsoned in thy leave. O world, thou wast the forest to this heart, and this indeed, O world, the heart of thee. How like a deer, strucken by many princes, dost thou lie here. Mark Antony. Pardon me, Caius Cassius. As the enemies of Caesar who shall say this, then, in a friend, it is called modesty. I blame you not for praising Caesar so. But what compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends, or shall we on and depend not on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was, indeed, swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends, am I with you all, and love you all, upon this hope, that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. Well, that's all I seek. And am, moreover, suited that I may produce his body to the marketplace, and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter. By your pardon, I will myself to the pulpit first and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and by permission that we are contented Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage us more than do us wrong. I know not what may fall. I like it not. Mark Antony, here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar and say that you do it by our permission. Else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going after my speech has ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body then and follow us. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which, like dumb mouths, do ope their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. 
Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war, all pity choked with the custom of fell deeds. And Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Arte by his side, come hot from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc, and let slip the dogs of war, that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. You, you serve Octavius Caesar, do you not? I do, Mark Antony. Caesar did right for him to come to Rome. He did receive his letters and his coming, and bid me say to you by word of mouth, <gasps> Oh, Caesar! Thy heart is big. Get thee apart and weep. Passion, I see, is catching. For mine eyes, seeing those beads of sorrow stand in thine, began to water. Is thy master coming? He lies tonight within seven leagues of Rome. Post back with speed, and tell him what hath chanced. Here is a morning Rome, a dangerous Rome. No Rome of safety for Octavius yet. I hence and tell him so. Yet, stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne this course into the marketplace. There shall I try in my oration how these people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. According to the witch, thou shalt discourse to young Octavius of the state of things. Lend me your hand. Act 3, Scene 2, The Forum We will be satisfied! Let us be satisfied! And follow me and give me audience, friends, and public reason shall be rendered of Caesar's death. I will hear Brutus speak. The noble Brutus is ascended! Silence! Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say, that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than Caesar were dead to live all as free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak. For him, I have offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any, speak for him I have offended. Who is here so vile that would not love his country? If any, speak for him I have offended. I pause for a reply. None, Brutus, none. Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital, his glory not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offences enforced for which he suffered death. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this I depart that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, Brutus, live, live. Bring him with triumph home unto his house. Give him statue with his ancestors. Let him be Caesar. Shall Caesar's better parts be crowned in Brutus? Well, bring him to his house with shouts and clamors. My countrymen. 
Peace, silence, Brutus speaks. Peace, ho. Good countrymen, let me depart alone. And for my sake, stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony by our permission is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. Stay ho, and let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go up into the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. Hmm. To our best, he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant. Oh, nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Please, let us hear what Antony can say. You gentle Romans. Please, ho, oh, let us hear him. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment. Thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words. He would not take the crown, therefore tis certain he was not ambitious. It be found so, some will dear abide for it. Poor soul. His eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yea, beg a hair of him for memory. And dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. The will, the will. We will hear Caesar speak. 
Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not me to you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And being men, bearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will, we'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will, Caesar's will. Will, will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors, honorable men. The will, the testament. They were villains, murderers. The will, read the will. You will compel me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Calm down, descend. Shall I leave? A ring, stand round. Stand from the hearse, stand from the body. Room for no. Antony, most noble Antony. Press not so upon me, stand far off. Stand back, room, bear back. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time Caesar ever put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent, the day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through, and see what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how kindly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him. Then burst his mighty heart. And in his mantle, muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep. And I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what? Weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded. Oh, look you here. Here is himself, marred, as you see, with traitors. Oh, piteous spectacle. Noble Caesar. Oh, woeful day. Oh, traitors, villains. Oh, most bloody sight. We will be revenge. Revenge! Seek about. Burn! Fire! Kill! Slay! Let not a traitor live! Stay, countrymen! He's there! Hear the noble Antony! We'll hear him! We'll follow him! We'll die with him! Good friends! Sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a fl sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honourable and will, no doubt, with reasons, answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend. And that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. <laughs> but were I Brutus, and Brutus, Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. What well, mutiny? We'll burn the house of Brutus. Away then. Come, let's seek the conspirators. Yet hear me, countrymen. Hear me speak. Peace, all. 
Here, Antony, most noble Antony. Why, friends, you go to do you know not what, wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves. Alas, you know not. I must tell you then, you have forgot the will I told you of. That's true. The will. Let's stay and hear the will. Here is the will, and under Caesar's seal. To every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. O royal Caesar! Hear me with patience. Please, ho! Oh! Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors, and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you, and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. Whence comes such another? Never. Never. Come. Away. Away. We'll burn his body in the holy place. And with the brands, fire the traitor's houses. Take up the body. Go, fetch fire. Pluck down benches. Pluck down forms, windows, anything. Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. Sir, Octavius is already come to Rome. Where is he? He and Artemidorus are at Caesar's house. And thither will I straight to visit him. He comes upon a wish. Fortune is merry and in this mood will give us anything. I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. Be like they had some notice of the people, how I had moved them. Bring me to Octavius. Act three, scene three, amongst Rome's streets. I dreamt this day that I did feast with Caesar, and things unlucky changed my fantasy. I have no will to wander forth of doors, yet something leads me forth. What is your name? Whither are you going? Where do you dwell? Are you a married man or a bachelor? Answer every man directly. I and briefly. I and wisely. I and truly, you are best. What is my name? Whither am I going? Where do I dwell? Am I a married man or a bachelor? Then to answer every man directly and briefly, wisely and truly. Wisely, I say, I am a bachelor. Not as much as to say they are fools that marry. You'll bear me a bang for that, I fear. Proceed directly. Directly. I'm going to Caesar's funeral. As a friend or an enemy? As a friend. That matter is answered directly. For your dwelling, briefly. Oh, briefly, I dwell by the capital. Your name, sir, truly. Truly, my name is Sinner. Tear him to pieces. He's a conspirator. Tear him, tear him. Come, Brands, ho! Firebrands to Brutus's, to Cassius's, burn all. Some to Decius's house, and some to Cascus, and some to Trebonius's. Away! Go!
Scene 1, at Caesar's home. These many then shall die, their names are pricked. Your brother too must die. Consent you, Artemidorus. I do consent. Prick him down, Antony. Upon condition, Publius shall not live. Who is your sister's son, Mark Antony? He shall not live. Look, with a spot I damn him. But Artemidorus, go you, fetch the will hither to Caesar's house, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacies. What, shall I find you here? Or here, or at the capital? This is a slight, unmeritable man, meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit, the threefold world divided, he should stand one of the three to share it? So you thought him, and took his voice, who should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription. Octavius, I have seen more days than you. And though we lay these honors on this man to ease ourselves of diverse slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven as we point the way. And 
having brought our treasure where we will then take we down his load and turn him off like to the empty ass to shake his ears and graze in commons. You may do your will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. <laughs> so is my horse, Octavius. And for that, I do appoint him store of provender. It is a creature that I teach to fight, to win, to stop, to run directly on. His corporal motion governed by my spirit. And in some taste is Artemidorus, but so. He must be taught and trained and bid go forth. A barren spirited fellow, one that feeds on abjects, orts and imitations, which out of use and staled by other men begin his fashion. Do not talk of him, but as a property. And now Octavius, listen, great things. Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head. Therefore, let our alliance be combined, our best friends made, our means stretched, and let us presently go sit in council. Our covert matters may be best disclosed and open perils surest answered. Let us do so. For we are at the stake and bedded about with many enemies. And some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. Act 4, Scene 2, Brutus's War Camp. Stand ho! Give the word ho and stand. What now, Lucilius? Is Cassius near? He is at hand, and Decius is come to do you salutation from Cassius. He greets me well. Our dear friend Decius, in his own charge, or by your officers, hath given me some worthy cause to wish things done undone. But if he be at hand, then I shall be satisfied. I do not doubt, but that noble Cassius will appear such as he is, full of regard and honour. He is not doubted. A word, Lucilius. How he received you, let me be resolved. With courtesy and with respect enough, but not with such familiar instances, nor with such free and friendly conference as he hath used of old. Thou hast described a hot friend cooling. Ever note, Lucilius, when love begins to sicken and decay, it useth an enforced ceremony. There are no tricks in plain and simple faith, but hollow men, like horses hot at hand, make gallant show and promise of their mettle. But when they should endure the bloody spur, they fall their crests, and like deceitful jades sink in the trial. Comes his army on? They mean this night in Sardis to be courted. The greater part, the horse in general, are come with Cassius. Hark, he has arrived. March gently on to meet him. Stand ho! Stand ho! Speak the word along. Stand! 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 Most noble brother, you have done me wrong! Judge me, you gods, wrong I mine enemies. And if not so, how should I wrong a brother? Brutus, the sober form of yours hides wrongs, and when you do them, Cassius, you and- be content. Speak your griefs softly. I do know you well. Before the eyes of both our army here, which should perceive nothing but love from us, let us not wrangle. Bid them move away, then in my tent, Cassius, enlarge your griefs, and I will give you audience. Decius, bid our commanders lead their charges off a little from this ground. Lucilius, do you the like, and let no man come to our tent till we have done our conference. Let Lucilius and Trebonius guard our door. Brutus, that you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noticed Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, wherein my letters praying on his side because I knew the man was slighted off. You wronged yourself to write such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offence should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius. You yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm, to sell and mark your officers for gold to undeservers. I, an itching palm? You know that you are Brutus when you speak this, or by the gods this speech were else your last. The name of Cassius honours this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement? Remember March? The Ides of March, remember? Did not great Julius bleed for justice's sake? 
What villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice? What, shall one of us that struck the foremost man of this world but for supporting robbers, shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honours for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I had rather be a dog and bay at the moon than such a Roman. Brutus, bay not me. I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier. I older in practice, abler than yourself to make conditions. Go to, you are not Cassius. I am. I say you are not. Urge me no more or I shall forget myself. Have mind upon your health, tempt me no further. Away, slight man. Is it possible? Hear me, for I will speak. Must I give way and room to your rash collar? Shall I be frighted when a madman stares? Oh, ye gods, ye gods, must I endure this? All this I more, fret till your proud heart break. Go show your slaves how choleric you are and make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humour? By the gods, you shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you. For from this day forth, I will use you for my mirth, yea, for my laughter when you are waspish. You've come to this. You say you are a better soldier. Let it appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For mine own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me in every way, Brutus. You wrong me. Did I say elder soldier? No. I said elder, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he durst not have thus have moved me. Peace, peace, you durst not so have tempted him. I durst not. No. What, durst not tempt him? For your life, you durst not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that I shall be sorry for. You have done that you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind, which I respect not. I did send to you for certain sums of gold, which you denied me, for I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than wring from the hard hands of our peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send to you for gold to pay my legions, which you denied me. Was that done like Cassius? Should I have answered Caius Cassius so, when Marcus Brutus grows so covetous to lock such rascal counters from his hit friends? Oh, be ready, gods, with all your thunderbolts. Dash him to pieces. I denied you not. You did. I did not! He was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus, you have rived my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could never see such faults. A flatterer's would not, though they do appear as huge as high Olympus. Come, Antony, and come, young Octavius. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of this world. Hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, conned and learned by rote, to cast into my teeth. Oh, I could weep my spirit from mine eyes. There is my dagger. And here, my naked breast, within a heart dearer than Plutus mine, richer than gold. If that thou beest a Roman, Take it forth, take it. I that denied thee gold will give my heart. Strike as thou didst at Caesar, for I know when thou didst hate him worse, thou lovest him better than thou ever lovest Cassius. Sheath your dagger. Be angry when you will, it shall have scope. Do what you will, dishonor shall be humor. Oh, Cassius. You are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire, who much enforced shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again. Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him. When I spoke that I was ill-tempered too. 
Do you confess as much? Take my hand. And my heart too. Oh, Brutus. What's the matter? Have you not love enough to bear with me when that rash humour which my mother gave me makes me forgetful? Yes, Cassius. And from henceforth, when you are over earnest with your Brutus, he'll think your mother chides and leave you so. <laughs> Lucilius, Trebonius. <clears throat> Bid the commanders prepare to lodge their companies tonight and, uh, and come yourselves. And come yourselves, right, and bring Metellus with you immediately to us. And bring us a bowl of wine. <sighs> I did not think you could have been so angry. Cassius, I am sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. No man bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Portia? She is dead. How escaped I killing when I crossed you so? Oh insupportable and touching loss upon what sickness impatient of my absence and grief that young octavius with mark antony have made themselves so strong for with her death that tidings came with this she fell distract and her attendants absent swallowed fire and died so even so. Oh, ye immortal gods. Speak no more of her. <clears throat> Give me a bowl of wine. In this I bury all unkindness, Cassius. Oh, my heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. Fill, Lucilius, fill till the wine o'er swell the cup. I cannot drink too much of Brutus' love. Come in, Trebonius. <laughs> Welcome, good Metellus. Now, sit we close about this taper here and call in question our necessities. Hush, art thou gone? No more, I pray you. Metellus, I have here received letters that young Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us a mighty power, bending their expedition towards Philippi. Myself have letters of the selfsame tenor. With what addition? That by prescription and bills of outlawry, Octavius Antony and Artemidorus have put to death a hundred senators. Therein our letters do not well agree. Mine speak of 70 senators that died by their prescriptions. Cicero being one. Cicero one. Cicero is dead and by that order of prescription. <laughs> have you had letters from your wife, my lord. No, Metellus. Nor nothing in your letters writ of her. Nothing, Metellus. That, methinks, is strange. Why I ask you? Hear you aught of her and yours? Uh, no, my lord. Now, as you are a Roman, tell me true. Then, like a Roman, Bear the truth I tell, for she is certain dead, and by strange means. Why? Farewell, Portia. We must die, Metellus, with meditating that she must die once. I have the patience to endure it now. Even so, great men, great losses should endure. I have as much of this in art as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so. Well, to our work alive. What do you think of marching to Philippi to presently? I do not think it good. No reason? 
Yes, it is. It is better that the enemy seek us. So shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offense, whilst we, lying still, are full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must, of force, give place to better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added, and encouraged. From which advantage shall we cut him off, if at Philippi we do face him there? These people at our back. Hear me, good brother. Under your pardon, you must note beside that we have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful. Our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We at the height are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such full sea are we now afloat. And we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Then with your will go on. We'll along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. The deep of night has crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will grasp at with a little rest. There is no more to say? No more. Good night. Early tomorrow we will rise and hence. Lucilius, <clears throat> my gown. Farewell, good Metellus. Good night, Trebonius. Noble, noble Cassius. Good night and good repose. My dear brother, this was an ill beginning of the night. Never come such division between ourselves. Let it not, Brutus. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Good night, Lord Brutus. Good night, Lord Brutus. Farewell, everyone. Give me the gown. Uh, where is thy instrument? Uh, here in the tent. <laughs> what? Thou speakest drowsily. Oh, poor knave, I blame thee not. Thou art o'erwatched. Ah, look, Lucilius. Here is the book I sought for, so I put it in the pocket of my gown. <laughs> I was sure your lordship did not give it to me. Bear with me, good boy. I am much forgetful. Can thou hold up thy heavy eyes a while and touch thy instrument a strain or two? I, my lord, and please you. It does, my boy. Uh, I trouble thee too much, but thou art willing. It is my duty, sir. I should not urge thy duty past thy might. I know young bloods look for a time of rest. Oh, I have slept, my lord, already. <laughs> it was well done. And thou shalt sleep again. I will not hold thee long. If I do live, I will be good to thee. This is a sleepy tune. Oh, oh, murderous slumber. Layest thou thy leaden mace upon my boy that plays thee music. Gentle knave, good night. I will not do thee so much wrong to wake thee. If thou dost nod, thou breakest thy instrument. I'll take it from thee. And good boy, good night. <sighs> Let me see. Let me see now. Is not the leaf turned down where I left reading? Here it is, I think. How ill this taper burns. Ah, who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makest my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me what thou art. Thy evil spirit, Brutus. Why comest thou? <laughs> To tell thee thou shalt see me at Philippi. Well, 
Then I shall see thee again. Aye. At Philippi. I, I will see thee at Philippi then. Now I have taken heart, thou vanishest. Ill spirit, I would hold more talk with thee. Boy, Lucilius, awake. Strings, my lord, falls. He thinks he still is at his instrument. Lucilius, awake. Mm, my lord. Didst thou dream, Lucilius, that thou would so criedest out? My lord, I did not know that I did cry. Yes, that thou didst. Didst thou see anything? Nothing, my lord. Sleep again, Lucilius. Act 5, Scene 1. Octavius and Antony's war camp. Now, Antony, our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down, but keep the hills and upper regions. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us at Philippi here, answering before we do demand of them. Tut. I'm in their bosoms, and I know wherefore they do it. They could be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to fasten in our thoughts that they have courage. But tis not so. Prepare you, generals! The enemy comes on in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. Octavius, lead your battle softly on upon the left hand of this even field. Upon the right hand, I Keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. Mark Antony, do we give sign of battle? Answer on their charge. Make forth. The generals would have some words. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the whole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, long live, hail Caesar. Antony. Antony. The posture of your blows are yet unknown, but for your words they rob the Hybla bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless too. Oh yes, and soundless too, for you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains. You did not so when your vile daggers hacked one another in the sides of Caesar. You showed your teeth like apes and fawned like hounds and bowed like bondmen kissing Caesar's feet. Whilst damned Casca, like a cur behind, struck Caesar on the neck. <laughs> oh, you flatterers. Flatterers. Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today. If Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. Arguing makes us sweat. The proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you then that sword comes up again? Never. Till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged. Or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou bring, bringest them with thee. So I hope I was not born to die on Brutus's sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honourable. A peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honour, joined with a masker and a reveller. The old Cassius still. Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs. Why now blow wind, swell billow, and swim bark? The storm is up and all is on the hazard. Oh, Lucilius, ha, a word with you. My lord. Metellus. What says my general? Metellus, <clears throat> this is my birthday, as this very day was Cassius born. Give me thy hand, Metellus. 
Be thou my witness that against my will as Pompey was, am I compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. You know that I held Epicurus strong and his opinion. Now I change my mind and partly credit things that do presage. Coming from Sardis on our former ensign, two mighty eagles fell and there they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands, who to Philippi here consorted us. This morning are they fled away and gone, and in their steads do cravens, crows, and kites fly o'er our heads, and down would look on us as we were sickly prey. Their shadows seem a canopy most fatal, under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. I do believe it, but partly. For I am fresh of spirit, and resolved to meet all perils very constantly. Even so, Lucilius. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together? What? If we lose this battle, are you contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end the work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, at everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, oh, we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made. Forever and forever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, tis true, this parting was well made. Why then, lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere to come. But su sufficeth to say the day will end, and then the end is known. Come, ho, away! Act 5, Scene 2, Later Upon the Field of Battle. Cassius! Brutus gave the word too early, who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil whilst, whilst we, by Antony, are all enclosed. Fly further off, my lord, fly further off. Mark Antony is in your tents. My lord, fly. Therefore, noble Cassius, fly far off. The hill is far enough. Look, look, Trebonius, are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Trebonius, if thou lovest me, mount thou my horse and hide thy spurs in him till he hath brought thee up to yonder troops and here again, that I may rest assured whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a thought. Go, Decius, get higher on that hill. My sight was ever thick. Regard Trebonius and tell me what thou knowest about the field. <laughs> This day I breathed first. Time is come round, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Sir, what news? Oh, my lord. What news? Trebonius is enclosed round about with horsemen. They make him turn the spur, yet he spurs on. Now they're almost on him. Now, Trebonius, now some light. Oh, he lights too, his pain. <laughs> and hark, they shout for joy. Come down, come down, behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long to see my best friend tame before my face. Decius, come hither, Sirrah. I swore thee. Saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath, and with this good sword, 
that ran through Caesar's bowels. Sir, this bosom, stand not to answer. Here, take thou the hilt, and when the face is covered as tis now, guide thou the sword. <laughs> Caesar, thou art revenged, even with the sword that killed thee. So I am free. There would not have been, durst I have done my will. Oh, Cassius, far from this country, Decius shall run, where never Roman shall take note of him. It is but change, Trebonius, for Octavius is overthrown by noble Brutus' power, as Cassius' legions are by Antony. These tidings will well comfort Cassius. Where did you leave him? All disconsolate with Decius, our brother, on this hill. Is not that he that lies upon the ground? He lies not like the living. Oh, my heart. It's not that he. Oh, this was he, Metellus. But Cassius is, is no more. Oh, setting sun, as in thy red rays thou dost sink to night, so in his red blood Cassius' day is set. The sun of Rome is set, our day is gone. Clouds, dews, and dangers come. Our deeds are done. Mistrust of my success hath done this deed. Mistrust of good success hath done this deed. Oh, hateful error. Melancholy's child, why dost thou show to the apt thoughts of men the things that are not? Oh, error soon conceived, thou never comest unto a happy birth, but killst the mother that engendered thee. What? Decius! Where art thou, Decius? Seek him, Trebonius, whilst I go to meet the noble Brutus, thrusting this report into his ears. I may say, thrusting it for piercing steel and darts and venomed shall be as welcome to the ears of Brutus as tidings of this sight. Hi you, Metellus. And I will seek for Decius a while. Why didst thou send me forth, brave Cassius? Did I not meet thy friends? And did not they put on my brows this wreath of victory and bid me give it thee. Didst thou not hear their shouts? Alas, thou hast misconstrued everything. But hold thee, take this garland on thy brow. Thy Brutus bid me give it thee and I will do his bidding. Brutus come apace and see how I regarded Caius Cassius. By your leave, gods, this is a Roman's part. Come, Cassius' sword, and find Trebonius' heart. Where, where, Metellus, does his body lie? Lo, yonder, and Trebonius mourning it. Trebonius's face is upward. He is slain. <sighs> oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Brave Trebonius. Look whether he have not crowned dead Cassius. Are yet two Romans living such as these? The last of all the Romans. Fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, 
I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Come, therefore, and to Thassos send his body. His funeral shall not be in our camp, lest it discomfort us. Lucilius, come, and come, young Casca, let us to the field. It's three o'clock, and Romans, yet ere night we shall try fortune in a second fight. Act 5, Scene 3, back at Brutus's camp. You will go to die. Only I yield to die. There are so much that thou wilt kill me straight. Kill Brutus, and be honoured in his death. We must not, a noble prisoner. Room, hold! Tell Antony, Brutus is tain. I'll tell the news. Here comes the general. Brutus is tain. Brutus is tain, my lord. Where is he? Safe, Antony. Brutus is safe enough. I dare assure thee that no enemy shall ever take alive the noble Brutus. The gods defend him from so great a shame. When you do find him or alive or dead, he will be found like Brutus, like himself. This is not Brutus, friend. But I assure you a prize no less in worth. Keep this man safe. Give him all kindness. I had rather have such men my friends than enemies. Go on, and see whether Brutus be alive or dead, and bring us word into Octavius' tent how everything is chanced. Act 5, Scene 4, The Remains of Brutus's Army. Come, um, poor remains of friends, rest on this rock. Statilius showed the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is or tain or slain. Put thee down, Casca. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Hark thee, Casca. What? I, my lord? No, not for all the world. Peace, then. No words. I'd rather kill myself. J shall I do such a deed? Come, hear the good Metellus. List a word. What says my lord? By this, Metellus. The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night. At Sardis once, and this last night here in Philippi's fields. I know my hour has come. Not so, my lord. Nay, I'm sure it is, Metellus. Thou seest the world, Metellus, how it goes. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Good Metellus, thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that our love of old, I prithee, hold thou my sword hilts whilst I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord, there is no tarrying here. Farewell to you, my friend, and you, Metellus. I shall have glory by this losing day more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus's tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes. My bones would rest that have but laboured to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence, I will follow. Farewell, good Romans. Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. Please.
please give a big round of applause for the citizens of Rome. The aristocracy. Caesar's loyalists. The conspirators. And the ringleaders. Let us not forget the people behind the scenes who've brought this lovely play to your screens, the creative, technical, and production team. Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie Collette. I am the director of Julius Caesar. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we have in making it. Uh, if you enjoyed Julius Caesar, check out Stream Shakespeare's YouTube channel where the videos of our past performances are uploaded. And of course, Stream Shakespeare will be continuing to present live streamed stage readings of Shakespeare's work. Don't miss next Sunday's play, The Tempest, directed by Alex Perrett, live streaming from 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And if you stick around for a few moments uh, after the curtain call, you will see a little teaser trailer for that. Uh, please like and share this video and follow Stream Shakespeare on all your social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, we're there at Stream Shakespeare. Thank you so much. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend. Bye for now and see you all next week.